Okay. Uh, the novice announces his arrival, takes a bow, enters the temple, and in the innermost silence sits by the Zen master. The master then tells the novice, you can hear the sound of two hands when they clap together. Now show me the sound of one hand. The novice had went to his room in order to consider the problem and kept coming back to the master imitating one sound after another. It was all in vain. All of his attempts were discarded by the master. Then novice went to meditate. For almost a year he pondered what the sound of one hand might be. After he transcended all the sounds, so the story goes, he finally reached the sound of one hand. It's a soundless sound. But what could the soundless sound might be? As we say, we are clueless on this matter. Maybe the sound of one hand clapping can be shown if it cannot be seen. This is the ambition of this paper, to show you the soundless sound. In the recent years, Catherine Malabu dedicated her work uh, to rethinking philosophy and psychoanalysis in the light of advancements made by neuro neurobiology. In her masterpiece, The New Wounded, she presents multiple cases from contemporary neurobiology in which uh, it is not possible to separate the organic wound from its uh, physical, uh, psychical repercussions, after which she uses some of the aspects of what is involved in the, her neuroscience uh, critique of psychoanalysis uh, in order to uh, uh, philosophically generalize them into a kind of fundamental ontology. Her powerful critique of psychoanalytic theory deserves to be addressed on multiple levels, which is something I cannot do full justice in the course of this paper. My aim here is to present her critique and subsequently to critique the critique itself. It seems to me there are two ways to do that. To put her critique under the strong critique that aspires to show how Malabu misses something crucial regarding the foundations uh, of the psychoanalytic theory at the cost of rendering her virulent attack on psychoanalysis ineffective. Or to put Malabu's critique under the weak critique that includes the revision of clinical cases which she uses as evidence in a carefully constructed case against psychoanalysis. The claim defended in this paper is that the weak critique of the critique, which refrains uh, itself from uh, cross-examining the foundations of psychoanalytic edifice, can present even a more interesting challenge to Malabu's project than the strong critique. It can also point directly to the contemporary relevance of psychoanalysis. For the time being, I'll make concession to Malabu and, and agree to two of her ideas that the distortion of the psychic apparatus reveals the mechanisms of its functioning and that the difference between psychic wounds uh, uh, lies only in degree and not in kind. I will also follow Malabu's steps by taking anosognosia as the paradigm of the psychic wound, the most exemplary of all cases of the psychic dysfunctioning and, at the same time, just one case among the others. After reassessing clinical studies which dealt with the, uh, uh, the diagnosis of anosognosia, I'll try to show that anosognosia does not display features which, which would contradict the purported foundations of psychoanalysis and that the psychoanalytic model Malabu herself has presented could be retained, expanded and upgraded. So, Psychoanalysis and neurology share the, uh, they share the task of thinking of the psyche as something that entails both, uh, both the autoregulation of the system and the intrusion of the alaya, both economic necessity and the irreducible margin of indetermination. According to Malabu, both psychoanalytic and neuroscientific theories are forced to balance uh, delicately between the system, understood as a continuity of regulating structures and dynamics, and events understood as the discontinuity of uh, disturbances uh, and breaches over, all, all over the system. This shared task immediately appears as a point of rupture. The psychoanalytic and neurological conceptions of the relation between the systems and event, the structure and the accident, along with their uh, conceptions of the event itself, are radically opposed to one another. Uh, let us sketch the reasons why Malabu presents her case uh, against psychoanalysis in the first case by all too briefly presenting the psychoanalytic conceptions of the way in which exogenous causes impact intrapsychic mechanisms or, as one might say in the idiom of this symposium, how the structure receives the event. So, uh, first we'll be dealing with the structure in a non-philosophical... She, she doesn't really... she uses uh, the system and the structure uh, in, in the same way, 
uh, and doesn't really make a difference between them and of course there is a difference but uh, under grain uh, uh, pretty much uses the same thing in his uh, psychic causality so I don't see that uh, as a kind of problem which needs to be addressed in this context. Uh, the best starting point in this laborious task is the notion of auto-affection, uh, which has become cornerstone of Malabu's philosophical reflection of neurosciences. Within the philosophical tradition, auto-affection constitutes a kind of primordial self-touching uh, by which we feel our unique presence. The I experiences the succession of the, uh, its states of consciousness as its own. The I speaks to itself and hears itself speaking. The I solicits and interpellates itself. The production of difference of the self from itself is the condition of identity. In contrast to philosophy, psychoanalysis and neurology do not equate auto-affection with the sentience uh, which feels itself. These are the disciplines which deal with unconscious processes. The most important disagreement between these two disciplines and consequent divergence emerges when they tackle the matter of brain's capacity for auto-affection. While neurology discovers brain as an entity capable for representation of external and internal stimuli to itself and for managing them, psychoanalysis is constituted on the premise that the brain is not equipped for auto-affection. Uh, Malabu pays a lot of attention to what she considers to be essential difference between the nervous system and the psyche within the Freud's corpus. The tenet of Freudian theory, according to Malabu, is the principle of inertia, which uh, states that the system tends to reduce the energetic tension to zero. This ca test cannot be done due to ceaseless endogenous excitation. For that reason, Freud introduced the principle of a constancy, just another name for the principle of inertia, uh, which governs over the system incapable for defense from internal excitation. So the basic assumption of Freudian analysis is biological in character. The nervous system is apparatus whose function is to eliminate incessant excitations, to lower excitations to the lowest possible level, and to come as close as possible to the state completely free of excitation. Freud, as it is obvious from this description, never claimed that the nervous system has to receive its stimuli from outside. On the contrary, he always affirmed the existence of endogenous stimuli or excitation internal to the nervous system. But he also maintained that the nervous system cannot respond to this excitation, which is to say it cannot manage the stimuli which itself has produced. That stimuli, that internal pressures, constitute the drive at, as the border zone between the psyche and the soul. The essence of the drive, Rice Freud in, the mo in his most succinct treatment of these problematics, lies within the organism, in the source of the excitation. The drive is the constant force, and it cannot be overcome by flight. The work of drive uh, redirects part of the energy access from the nervous system to another system, psychical apparatus. How does this uh, redirection occur? Let us make clear this point along with Malabu. The difference between nervous energy and psychical energy, the two types of energy, uh, does not uh, name uh, two different kinds of energy, but rather differentiate ways of the circulation of energy. The crucial thing is that the nervous system does not know how to manage itself, does not know uh, how to manage itself as soon as it finds itself confronted with another dynamic uh, uh, which is different from the primary logic of the reflex. That is, as soon as it finds itself confronted with an urgency, a pressure, a constant, constant non-localized uh, force from the inside. The nervous energy is unable to propose or to produce form of exteriorization or liquidation analogous to muscular discharge in order to rid itself of internal trust. Uh, thirst. Uh, with internal thirst there is no blow, there is no wound, just a constant pressure from which it's seemingly impossible to escape. The only escape from the energetic standpoint is pseudo-escape. The organism tries to escape from this pressure by developing the psyche and its defense mechanisms. Let's take the projection as the well-known example. The origin of projection, that is, uh, the illusionary uh, externalization of internal phenomena, uh, as in the persecutory complexes of paranoid uh, psychotics, is the need to treat inter internal excitation from which, it, from which it, it is actually impossible to escape as an external excitation capable of, of being fled from. The origin of projection is transformation of an internal, escapable danger into an external, manageable one. 
So, let us conclude. The nervous system cannot manage uh, the excitation and it is for that reason it doubles itself with the psychic apparatus. Psychic apparatus is the system for managing excitation, a structure capable of, for repre of representation. Now, the conception of event, Freudian conception of event. Freud establishes a fundamental distinction between two aspects of event, arrhythmia and erlebnis. Arrhythmia is an event understood as arriving externally from material reality, and its performance is completely unexpected. Leibniz is an event understood in attaining of meaning. Freud has uh, first identified a psychic event as a combination of arrhythmia and erlebnis. If one uh, uh, aspect of event cannot be translated into the other, the event will not be registered as such. How does this compound on translation occur? Uh, Freud sets a transformer between arrhythmia and erlebnis, phantasm. Phantasms precede exogenous events. They are always already there because they arise as a desperate attempt uh, at escape from what Freud called the constant return of eternal stimuli, which are constitutive constitutive of life itself. In each subsequent revision of Freudian theory, Ereignis loses its importance in favor of Erlebnis. Freud did ultimately defend the idea uh, of external event owing its effectiveness <coughs> internally to phantasm. Therefore, a uh, phantasm of his uh, of in his ma mature work is no longer meant as a knot connecting that which arrives externally and that which the psychic experience as a result, that is a knot uh, uh, betwe between arrhythmia and erlebnis. We can no longer talk about accidental event and its psychological reception. When we talk about uh, psychic causation, we no longer talk about two realities, the material and the psychic one, but the twofold aspect of a single psychic reality. The difference uh, between interiority uh, and exteriority no longer corresponds solely to the division of material and psychic reality, but to internal division of psychic reality itself. The knot becomes inextricably linked to the structure of this reality. It is important to be at least a little clearer on this point. An event that comes from material reality can result in psychic damage without being an essential uh, direct or immediate cause of the damage. Uh, inst instead, it only activates the al always already existing phantasmal scenarios. Psychic reality is in such a way emancipated for external events uh, and so it always precedes them. The relationship uh, between material and psychic reality will be easier expl explicate on specific material. I choose an example that seems most relevant because it shows the primacy of psychic over material reality in regards to interpretation of a dream in a Freudian as well, uh, uh, in, as, well as in Lacanian approach to the problem while also demonstrating considerable differences between the, these two approaches. The example is that of famed dream by which Freud opens the seventh chapter of the interpretation of dreams. So, a father kept vigil for days and nights uh, at the beside of a sick child. When the child dies, the father goes into the next room to get some rest, but leaves the door of his bedroom open in order to be, uh, to be able to look into the other room where his child, uh, child's corpse lay uh, staged on the bar surrounded by large candles. An old man was hired to stand guard and, and sitting next to the dead child, he muttered some prayers. After a few hours of sleep, the father uh, dreams of a child standing next to his bed, grabbing him by the arm and whispering to him imploringly, Father, can't you see I'm burning? As he awoke, he noticed the bright light coming from the room where the bear was. He hurries into the room and sees, uh, and sees that the old man had dozed off, while the cover and one arm have been burned by a lighted candle which fell next to them. How can we explain this dream? Soft light was seeping through the, the open door, catching the father's eye, as little by little the external stimuli became quite strong, provoking the same effect as they would, as they would have if the father was awake. He recognized that it is the light of the candle which had caused the fire near the corpse and the accompanying reaction. The father was likely himself worried that the old guard was not up to the task, and so he carried this concern into his dream. This, this explanation makes sense. Freud would not object to this explanation, but he would ask a question of crucial importance which would invert the whole, its whole rationale. Why does the father dream at all? 
why the light, the smoke, the heat, stimuli from its uh, material reality simply not awake the father immediately. He would certainly respond faster and more effectively to the accident, increasing the chances of preventing a catastrophe. Because there is something more important than the accident, something that precedes it, something that was already there before it, the, de desire, the desire to see a child alive once more. If the father had awoken first, writes Freud, and then came uh, to the conclusion which led him into the bedroom, he would have shortened his child's life for that one moment. Lacan, as always, pays uh, uh, more attention and gives an interesting turn to the words that have been spoken in the dream. They will uh, take us to another question of coercion and importance and offer us an answer to it. Thinking about the same dream, Lacan in the 11th seminar, unlike Freud, asked himself, why has the father awoken at all? Because of what he encounters in the dream, a reality of his own desire, a reality in the form of his child who approaches him and says, Father, can you see I'm burning? That is a reality of those words which suggest, suggests that he is responsible for the death of his darling. A much more terrible reality than the material, external reality to which he will uh, woken up. The child has, in fact, died of a fever. It had a fever, his body was on fire before he died, and his father failed to help him. That's what haunts him. The, this fire has swallowed the child. In contrast to this terrifying fire, uh, the ray fire on the buyer from which the light was coming uh, was a manageable danger, a peril that could be extinguished. According to a Lacanian interpretation, the father is actually running away from a dream to a so-called reality in order to continue sleeping, to remain blind, to avoid awakening fully in the reality of his own desire. Freud and Lacan, as much as they are emphasizing different things in interpreting this dream, both undoubtedly believe that the psychic reality always already precedes the material one, has primacy over it, and that the material event in some way has to adapt to it. Indeed, the fire that is just becoming ignited in the room next to the sleeper could kill him, but the fire uh, that they really want to extinguish is already raging elsewhere in his soul. Freudian theory therefore recognizes the existence of two realities, a material and a psychic one. Material reality is a necessary requirement or condition for the psychic reality, but it's not sufficient. Psychic reality seems like an empire within an empire that has its own laws. Among the two realities, a gap exists. Events in the material reality can influence the psychic reality, but they do so either completely abolishing the psychic reality or, or only affecting it indirectly. An event, an accident or a disaster in material reality can destroy the brain and with it the psyche. This is a trivial, trivial event that is not of great interest. If some sort of accident befalls the brain, it is very likely to influence the, the psyche, but only indirectly, not as an essential cause. Uh, it will only act as a spark which has fallen on a barrel of gunpowder, not as an efficient cause of what is to follow. Psychic scene has already been set up, just waiting for the right opportunity to be activated by one of existing causal, effectual, phantasmatic scenarios. Now, Malabu wants to think uh, about the possibility of something that is located uh, in between a trivial and material disaster. Something that, uh, which uh, together with the brain destroys the psyche. Uh, uh, and the potential psychic disaster just waiting for the right opportunity or a material stimulus in order to actualize itself. In short, she wishes a random accident to be entirely random. So it would be best if she were able to find a catastrophe that would somehow manage to keep the body alive, but to destroy the psyche. We are not talking about a mere vegetative state, but a body that could do many things, almost all of the things that it was able to do before the accident. So it must be objected. In order to be able to do at least some of the things that it was able to do before, such a body should have a stable core of memories, beliefs and desires. In other words, it should have a psyche, and we started with the assumption that the psyche was destroyed by an accident. What remains is only one more untested option. Can we find a body whose soul has died, 
but uh, one that se uh, has secretly um, uh, almost imperceptibly been occupied by a new soul. Is such a macabre scenario even feasible? Destructive politicity, as the term, uh, gives an affirmative answer to this question, and to put the example forth, we will be aided by the strange case of Phineas Gage. Gage was a man who, during the mid-19th century, took part in the construction of railroad and was responsible for puncturing of stone barriers with explosives. During one such explosion, a long iron rod passed through his skull. Miraculously, he survived the accident with only an uh, injury uh, to his frontal lobe, from which, at least it so it seemed at first, he was recovering well. But soon it turned out that his recovery was not going well as it, is, as it appeared. Cage became moody and indifferent, and later indifferent to everything. He lost all attachment to his family and friends. His personality has changed completely and he became unrecognizable. He was there, but somehow he wasn't. The community in which he lived concluded finally that Gage was no longer Gage. Uh, what are the consequences of uh, many similar cases, uh, case histories in regards to psychoanalytic theory? Uh, they, according to Marabou, uh, represent a paradigm. The ultimate cases, but nevertheless only a handful of cases. Malabu is clear, if the story about Gage is well described, if indeed Gage was no longer Gage, then, then that contradicts the very foundations of psychoanalysis. Accordingly, she considers it necessary to abandon the existing model of psychic causation and attempt to formulate a different one on new principles, principles that should be sought in neuroscience. Malabu, in fact, considered psychoanalysis as a particular form of hermeneutics that privileges continuity and fails to think uh, discontinuity. She strives to show that Freud and his successors considered the relationship between exogenous and endogenous, that is, material and psychic reality, preferred the latter, so far as to completely deny uh, the ability of material events accidents or mishaps to directly, without the mediation of always, ready, always already present psychic mechanisms, affect the psyche. Always already is a thing that cannot be revoked, unless life itself is to be revoked. This thing is a code for psychic functioning and an ensurer of its continuity. Psychic continuity, however, can be disturbed, but with analytic effort it is possible to re-establish it. Any trauma which disturbs the psyche can, uh, can be resolved if the patient is able to reconstruct the continuity with guidance by building a causal chain of events that forms a story and then recognizes that story as his own. Resolving of trauma is related to inter, uh, interrelationship with the, between the trauma and the story, narrativization of trauma, the gift of speech by which the psyche is able to repair any damage it has suffered. At this point, Malabu's critique begins. The speech of trauma's victims, she writes, does not possess revelatory meaning. To, to the contrary, certain brain injuries allow us to witness absolute discontinuity, a definitive break with the past, something irreparable, something that uh, the affected person will never again be able to talk about because that person no longer exists. The damage that uh, uh, discontinued his psyche has not abolished his life, a life which after the accident is no longer his, but belongs to someone else. How can we critique this critique of psychoanalysis? There are two ways to do that. With a strong critique of critique, which seeks to show how Mal uh, what Malabu has overlooked in regards to the very principle of psychoanalytic theory, causing her, her attack to miss the target, or with a weak critique of a critique or a revision of clinical cases that have been used as Malabu's evidence in carefully prepared indictment that she laid against psychoanalysis. So, uh, first, uh, the overview of the strong critique of the critique. If Malabu was able to successfully attack the always already as a basic principle of psychoanalysis, then it is necessary to show that the principle can defend itself against this attack. How can this be done? Lacanians have chosen the most extreme way. They have maintained the always already as a principle, that is, at the prime level, or, uh, as the prime level of psychic functioning, but have claimed uh, that it is not marked by continuity, but on the contrary, discontinuity. 
the events that constitute the subject are always already irretrievable uh, lost for this uh, for that subject and that every type of continuity is actually pseudo continuity the only cer uh, certain continuity in the psychic life is actually exposed as a series of discontinuities the accident which completely annuls a person's personality is only an extreme case of, what is, of, of that which is always already at work. Zizek and Johnston, two prominent Lacanians, have, in spite of their difference, uh, differences in reading uh, of books dedicated to the new wounded, criticized Malabu for not recognizing that Lacan, in following and correcting Freud, uh, has, o uh, has already reached her conclusions by gradual self-criticism and, in accordance with them, uh, revised the psychoanalytic axiomatics or metapsychology. Let us briefly uh, take a look at Zizek's main complaint. In accordance with the above written, he believes that the post-traumatic subjectivity is only a classical Cartesian form of subjectivity. The subject is defined as a form capable of erasing all substantial content so that it might be new and present to both himself and to the world. In regard to the most serious of accident, the most destructive of new wounds, Zizek writes, what remains after the violent uh, traumatic attacks is a pure form of subjectivity that had to be there to begin with. Malabu, in her reply, will not even refute the idea uh, that the subject is essentially a break in continuity, but will change the emphasis of this insight in the light of this, this, this structural plasticity. She claims that the traumatic inter interruption does not reveal an old subject that is always already there. The traumatic shock in the most extreme version is not uh, only an in interruption that reveals the always or already of the psyche, but precisely an interruption with the always already. The most serious trauma does not reveal the transcendental uh, subject as a form, a pure form, but that which undermines this form, the threat of its explosion. Unlike Zizek, Johnston will not look for insights uh, on the discontinuity of the psyche in the philosophical tradition that ushers in psychoanalysis, but will draw attention to the late phase of, uh, phase of Lacan's teachings in which he comes to, uh, to insights similar to those reached by Malabu. Lacan has gradually completely abandoned the idea of fundamental inviolability of the psyche, its continuity and the possibility of historization, and has moved toward the reconceptualization of the trauma. It traverses the path from the ideal symbolization or narrativization of trauma uh, to the idea that trauma persists in spite of its narrativization, that is essentially tied to the material, uh, uh, and that the process of its symbolization, which could be equivalent to, the, to its dismissal, is simply impossible. Narrativization is only a mere uh, rationalization, and that enormous effective potential, which is compressed in the moment of trauma, because of that uh, traumatic, mo uh, traumatic event, uh, it could not uh, find an effective release, continues to reside in the unconscious despite of its narrations. Uh, this admits that the establishing of continuity through the means of narration is not nearly as equal as effectively uh, uh, resolving of the trauma. How is it possible to resolve the trauma or at least alleviate it, if not by narrativization? Uh, with the so-called traversing the phantasm, or uh, I have a longer section there which I skip. Uh, my point is that the establishing conditions in which all affective charge related to the trauma uh, they endure despite the narrativization and can be channeled in different manner. But since establishing of the same conditions is impossible, the trauma is in some way unresolvable. Uh, in addition to that, as Malabu demonstrates and Johnston readily concedes, there are some events that completely destroy a man's effective resources so as the passing of, uh, through the, uh, so that traversing the phantasm is no longer possible since the, since the phantasm no longer exists. It was also destroying the accident. A wounded person who cannot be helped can uh, come to the analyst, but the analyst can, uh, uh, can uh, very well be aware that the wounds uh, cannot be healed. His theory, says Johnson, foresees the possibility of, of the impossibility of helping some people. Now the weak critique of the critique. Malabu's aim is to critique the psychoanalytic understanding of causality and appeal for a formulation of a new understanding. 
The weak critique of the critique, uh, which admittedly does not examine the principles, may prove to be even more problematic in regard to her goal than the strong critique, thus demonstrating a, a contemporary relevance of psychoanalysis. In my critique of the critique, I will uh, keep from Malabu the idea of extreme pathology as a paradigm, uh, an extreme example that is nevertheless just one more among examples, and examining uh, in depth one of the most intriguing of Malabu's new wound, anosognosia. When the right hemisphere of the brain is damaged, a paralysis of the left extremities sometimes occur. As we might expect, most of the patients who end up in the neurology department complain about their paralysis, often asking the doctor when they will recover. What is surprising is that a small percentage of these patients for some time stubbornly insist that their left side is not paralyzed, even though they are mentally lucid in all other aspect, uh, respects. Therefore, a condition in which the patient is unable to recognize that he is ill a neuropathology that, due to extreme nature, Malabu has readily converted into a paradigm of new wounds. She writes, the denial that accompanies anosognosia, a brain pathology where patients are unable to recognize their sons as ill, is not denial in the Freudian sense. When the patient does not see that his left side is paralyzed, when he feels neither pain nor anxiety after a major brain injury, he is not responding to an effective imperative or unconsciously calculated blindness. He does not see because he cannot see. That's all. But is that really all? Anosognosia is usually the product of right hemisphere damage, most commonly damage to the inferior peri parietal cortex that causes denial of paralysis on the left side of the body. Most neuroscientists therefore argue that it must be understood as a neurological rather than psychological phenomenon. Point anchor. However, it, it may still be the case that anosognosia is simultaneously a neurological and psychological phenomenon. That is, uh, that is perhaps neurological damage and motivation are jointly necessary conditions for anosognosia. My case against Malabu rests on showing that there is a continuity between a healthy pre-accident person and the persons uh, who have suffered an accident and are uh, now diagnosed with anosognosia. Just to be clear, contrary to Malabu's claims, uh, this patient feels pain due uh, to his or her impairment. His, his or her blindness is unconsciously cal calculated and his or her denial is a response to affective imperative. Patients deny paralysis because the idea of impairment is severely disturbing to them. Uh, let us consider three examples that speak against Malabu. The first one is a case from clinical practice of Kaplan, Solms and Solms. With Mrs. A, their patient, they have noticed the coexistence of, of severe anosognosia on the one hand and a deep depression on the other. Therefore, we are faced, they have written linking the two problems of the patient with a paradoxical situation which, in which Mrs. A was depressed because of something that she claims that had never happened. It's logical to pose the question of how can a patient with a serious injury of the right hemisphere and the paralysis of the left part of the body, a new wound who apparently is not aware of her accident, simultaneously uh, be deeply depressed due to the damage and so personally affected by it that it even leads to a uh, suicidal ideation. Thinking about Mrs. A and other people who have experienced similar accidents, Soames and Kaplan Soames have su suggested that in such cases, negative emotions are not lacking, but rather they are dynamically repressed. Another example from clinical practice that does not go in favor of Malabu, but instead seriously undermines her understanding of uh, anosognosia, has been documented by Ramachandran. One of his older patients uh, ha uh, has developed anosognosia after suffering a stroke in the right hemisphere of her brain, which has paralyzed the entire left side of her body. She claimed that she is not paralyzed despite all of the evidence that have been presented to her, pointing to the contrary. After Ramachandra intervened with the vestibular caloric stimulation, which was designed to alleviate the feeling of pain in the patient, anosognosia abruptly withdrew. The patient has, in a brief interview conducted during that period, revealed that she is aware of her impairment and that uh, she knows perfectly well uh, about it and 
that she's been living with uh, that condition for a quite some time. While commenting on this case, Ramanchandran writes that we can conclude that on some deeper level, she was actually aware of the paralysis all along. Ramachandran and another neurologi neurologist, in attempting to explain <coughs> the sad state of their patients, reached for a denial of repression and reactive formation, psychological mechanisms of defense, the heritage of psychoanalysis. And now I borrowed the final example from the clinical practice of Viviana Strauss, who is a, a member of the neuropsychoanalytic group situated in Frankfurt and Cologne. It concerns Mrs. H, a 62-year-old patient diagnosed with a neglect syndrome, which included anosognosia. So uh, I will uh, read this uh, clinical vignette from the paper because uh, uh, it went missing from my attempt to write, rewrite the paper last night. Uh, a 62-year-old fem female patient showed all the signs of a neglect syndrome, including anosognosia. She suffered from a, par uh, a partial infarction of the right side of the hemisphere during an operation for clipping an aneurysm of the middle uh, cerebral artery. The lesion was followed by a pa paresis of the left arm and leg. She had divorced from her husband 15 years earlier, having uh, discovered that he had an affair with uh, her private secretary. In her professional life, she worked for an international organization in a quite di uh, distinctive position and had three grown-up children. The patient latched onto her old self-image and could not integrate her new self-image as someone uh, dependent and bodily damaged. She used to behave in the se uh, sessions if she uh, still occupied uh, her former uh, authoritarian role and spoke about her illness with certain soberness and without affect. She was uh, absolutely confident that she would soon be able to resume her professional life. In the night ses uh, session, the following incident happened. During her illness, the patient, uh, patient's ex-husband had, tech, had taken care of her and visited her, her fr frequently. She developed the idea that her husband would now come back to her and he had started to think about marrying him again. Uh, after a bitter awakening, in one of, of her weekend visits home, she endured an uh, epileptic seizure. In the session uh, we are describing now, Mrs. H was about to leave the hospital and go home. She started the session wanting to introduce her former husband to an analyst, convinced that he was in the same room with her, which was not the case. When she called him several times in vain, trying to search for him on her right side, and finally was told by the therapist that her husband was not there, she became very anxious and agitated. She insisted that he must be there and, as proof, pointed to her paretic leg, telling her analyst that uh, she can see his long leg. She seemed to be in a state of shock, centralizing her whole perception around the leg of her husband, which she saw uh, in her leg. Her leg represented his presence as a primary object, but also as a part of herself and her body. When it then finally became apparent to her that uh, he indeed was not in the room, she broke down crying desperately, expre expressing her anger about him for the first time in the sessions. This episode can be seen as an indication of the work of primary process mechanisms. The patient denies the absence of her husband, as well as divorce, and takes flight into the delusion or perception of her paratic leg as her husband's. This is the effect of defenses like denial, displacement and illusionary misperceptions, all elements of the Freudian unconscious. When the denial, denial can no longer be upheld, she descends into a desperate depression. Uh, this vignette shows how the neglect uh, as an unconscious adaptive mechanism presents the primary process uh, functions of the personality. Condensation, displacement, misconception, denial, false prototo, and substitution. So the central psychoanalytic claim is that emotions might distort our representations of reality through processes described by defenses. These defenses are motivated, and as Gnosia exemplifies central psychoanalytic tenet. Patients believe that their limb is healthy. Patients also simultaneously believe that their limb is significantly impaired 
and they are profoundly disturbed by this belief. Finally, and this is crucial, patients form the belief that their limb is healthy because they have concurrent belief that it is significantly impaired and they are disturbed by this belief. Contrary to what Malabu claims, the abundance of clinical material shows that the new wounded can see that they are ill, yet they also don't, uh, don't see it. They know what has happened to their bodies, but they do not want to know. Such cases seem like extreme cases described by Freud when he was trying to establish uh, uh, the existence of, uh, of uh, psychological defense mechanisms which include the patient knowing and not knowing about his own accident, as well as denying its existence when directly confronted with it. Anosognosia, due, its, due to its incredible character, really seems like a paradigm. The toughest, most exceptional, most exemplary, but at the same time the most typical of all, all examples. As Malabu would say, a true example and just one example of a psych uh, psychical wound. Anosognostic patients may suffer no more than an extreme version of the tendency we all expose. We all have to downplay our limitations as we protect ourselves from the events with aversive consequences. In this uh, aspect, anosognosia is not a new, but uh, uh, I am convinced a known wound from which people defend themselves by the very mechanisms that Freud uh, has recognized as so to describe as preci precisely as possible. So, let's go back to our Zen master. The doctor comes to see her patient who suffers from paralysis of the left side of the body and has been recently diagnosed with anosognosia. After the chatter that has become part of the daily routine, the doctor asks her patient if she can clap her hands. The patient seems perplexed by this childish request, but decides to play ball with the doctor and say that of course uh, she is perfectly capable of clapping her hands. The doctor insists on this childishness and begs her to clap for her. The patient raises her right arm, swings towards the left side of her body, but her left hand remains stuck to her torso, motionless. The doctor then asks the patient, has she clapped her hands uh, and the patient, in a somewhat confused manner, says that she, of course, had done just that. Indeed, she had clapped her hands. The, and that is the soundless sound, a sound of one hand clapping. <laughs>